they also, you know, produce uh, disinformation on Swapo that, you know, if Swapo comes, you know, their wives would be raped, they wouldn't have their wives any longer, they wouldn't have their children, they wouldn't have their cows, they wouldn't have their households. And thus uh, equating Swapo with, you know, the, the general remark of, look, you know, Swapo are communists and if they come, these are the things that are going to happen in this country. Dirk Mudge, a leader of the moderate DTA, is angry that the SADF have been telling villagers to vote for his party. Personally, and I've said it to the, to the commanders and to the South African government, I don't think any assistance by the SADF will in any way promote the interests of my party. So, should they go ahead with that, should they continue with that, if I would have been Swapu, I would have welcomed it. We don't want to be seen as anybody's stooge. Another major source of concern is the role of the notorious police counterinsurgency unit, Kufut, or Crowbar. Its 3,000 members have, according to the authorities, been disbanded and absorbed into the normal police force and will assist in maintaining law and order during the lead-up to independence. But there are only just over 6,000 policemen, so Kufut will form almost half of this force. They have the worst human rights record of any fighting group in Namibia and have been accused of repeated atrocities against civilians. Without doubt the most efficient fighting unit in Namibia, Kufut were responsible for killing over 70% of all guerrillas who died in the war. On March 14, the Namibian Supreme Court heard from Kufut men that they had been ordered to continue the war if Swapo won the election. Human rights lawyer David Smuts. They apparently had the highest so-called kill rate. However, in the process of doing so, they ruthlessly set about achieving that aim and in the process have trampled upon human rights and have a most appalling human rights record. As independence approaches, the United Nations forces will find themselves in a country bitterly divided against itself. The scars of war are everywhere. In the northern territories of Namibia, the UN will be confronted with roads which are often impassable. The war has left behind scores of unexploded landmines. The Namibian people are no strangers to war and colonial oppression. This statue on the outskirts of Vintuk commemorates those Germans who died in the early wars against the Nama and Herero speaking people. In that war, in the early part of this century, 60,000 out of 80,000 Herero speaking Namibians were exterminated by the Germans in a vicious campaign of genocide. It is little wonder that the Namibian people are seriously questioning whether or not a mere 4,500 UN troops can really bring peace to this vast and divided land. For South Africa Now, this is Tony Weaver in Oshikuku, Namibia. You're watching South Africa Now. Coming up next, our culture segment, featuring the best music, film, drama and artistic expression from Southern Africa. Some weeks ago, we reported on South Africa's most popular multiracial rock band, Savoga, and its lead singer, Johnny Clegg, an outspoken critic of apartheid. Recently, as was reported only on CBS News, an anti-apartheid concert he helped organize was banned by the government. South Africa faced a force today it didn't want to reckon with, the power of song, so it pulled the plug before the music could even start. Martha Teisner now with that. Today's concert, which would have been the biggest ever in South Africa, was banned. The government decided the music might have been dangerously political, a threat to security. A few scuffles after the last big concert in 1986 were cited by the government as the reason for the ban. Clegg is now in Los Angeles recording a new album. But another event he was involved in made the news on South African television. It was a hot and dusty day at Keats Drift near Greytown in Natal, but this did not dampen the enthusiasm of the 3,000-strong crowd gathered in this remote valley. The occasion? South Africa celebrated musician Johnny Clegg's renewal of his wedding vows to his wife Jenny in a traditional Zulu ceremony. <laughs> Although they were married on Valentine's Day last year, these festivities were to officially introduce Jenny to the Emanchuini clan, 
with whom Johnny has ties. The customary speeches were also made. Jenny's father, comparing her to a delicate flower that needs to be watered, appealed to Johnny's clan to take good care of her. Following tradition, Johnny also presented his father-in-law with Lobola, the bride price, which is usually paid in cattle. Times have changed somewhat, even in this rural district, and in this case, the Lobola was a brand new car. Few who attended the wedding will forget the pulsating drums and the rhythmic dancing of the warriors wanting to impress the coy maidens. It was a spectacle to remember. One footnote. Our congratulations this week go out to David Zucchino of the Philadelphia Inquirer, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting from South Africa. Thank you for watching South Africa Now. Transcripts are $3. Be sure to ask for show 209. If you want a free educational resource list about the issues we are covering, or to share your comments, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to South Africa Now, The Africa Fund, 198 Broadway, New York, New York, 10038. South Africa Now is produced on a non-profit basis by Global Vision in association with The Africa Fund.